In today's talk, I will be focusing on the role of mythology in shaping the imagination of children. So first, a little bit of personal experience. So, uh, just a minute, I'm just, all is okay. I hope I get a thumbs up sign so that I'm sure that I'm streaming and all is okay. So that, um, I'm just wait, just making sure that everything is okay. Okay, Dr. Patai. Thank you. Thank you. I removed myself from screen so that you could be visible to all. Okay, okay. Uh, So, uh, uh, you know, when I, uh, you know, even as a medical student, when I used to work, uh, we had to do internship and I had to go to a lot of schools as part of my internship. Uh, when I, we would be talking to children and sometimes I would have to sit with the children's room and I didn't know how to engage children because they were little kids. You know, uh, what do you tell? I didn't have children of my own. How do you talk to children? But I noticed one thing and it's a trick that I use even today. I start drawing. I would illustrate. So if let's say even today, if I go to someone's house and I see a lot of children in the house, I don't know how to talk to children, but I'll catch hold of one child and I'll say, tell me what you want me to draw. And the child will say, they look at me suspiciously. And then I will say, they'll say, okay, draw me a dog. And I draw a dog. And the moment I draw a dog and I draw very fast and I draw in a very particular style, I see the child completely spellbound. And before I know it, in within two minutes, all the children are with me and the parents are so happy that Devdutt Patnaik has done something magical because he's got the children's attention. And this is one big thing I learned that we learn children, you, you don't talk to children, you perform in front of children. And every time I have performed with my art, I have realized how people respond to art, illustration. If I'm giving a talk, if I'm giving a lecture, let's say in a children's festival, I realize that if I make sounds and I move my hands and I move my eyes and uh, do sound effects, then the children listen to me. And so if I'm telling them things like the mountain is very tall, they don't respond. But if I say it's very, 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 very tall, then they all, and I look up, then they also look up. And then I ask them to perform along with me, raise their hands, bring it down. And the child starts responding. And this is what I learned. Nobody taught me this. But I was very clear that I want my audience engaged. And if I want to be audience engaged, the most powerful technique is storytelling. But stories can be told in different ways. It is through sound. It is through visuals. It is by bodily gestures. And I realize this is what Bharata tells us in the Natya Shastra. In the Natya Shastra, he talks about ras or the movement of aesthetics. And he says, you have to use abhinay, which is expressions. You have to use patakas, which is hand gestures. You have to use angika, which is body gestures. You have to use costume. You have to use backgrounds. You have to use music. You have to use dialogue. So there are lots of things that are done to get the attention of the audience in the Natya Shastra. The whole purpose of the Natya Shastra is to get the attention of the audience and not to tell them a story, but to engage them. And that's good performance. The point is not to tell a story. The point is to engage the audience. If you don't engage the audience, the audience doesn't connect. Only when you know how to engage the audience, you start telling the story using the method of engagement. And therefore, you have to work at it. And I realize performance plays a very important role. So if you pick up any of my books, I've just kept one or two books to show you how I work. So when I'm writing a book for children, I will give a lot of attention to illustration. So illustrations play a very important role in my books. These are not illustrated by me. These were illustrated by a friend of mine. But I, this is illustrated by me. So I'll show you this book. This is called On the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. And so a little bit of marketing going on over here. But you can see this is my illustration. I use illustrations with big, simple eyes. And there's a lot of information in this illustration that is not immediately accessible, but I use performance. So for me, talking to children is a performance. The same is true for an audience. When I'm talking to you right now, I am performing. I'm using my sound, my body language. I'm using various tools to connect and engage you just as I would talk to any child. 
विच इज वाई डिजनी सेज वी आर टॉकिंग टू द चाइल्ड इन यू because we are all children at some time in our lives and therefore how do i uh, engage a child for me because i'm talking to your imagination i'm talking to i'm telling you about mountains that can fly i can talk to you about rivers that can talk i can talk to you about trees that transform into birds so i am really playing with your imagination and that is how i connect with the audience so what i'll do today is i have very limited time so i will divide since you are academicians i will divide my work uh, my talk into three sections um it's about communications so the 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 talk will have three points the transmitter you are the transmitter of the story two the content the story itself and three the receiver child teenager adult doesn't matter all storytelling has to keep in mind these three points there is a transmission there is a content which is being transmitted which has a lot of noise so it has to deal with a lot of other things so we have to get a work very hard to make sure the content goes through and then comes the receiver who is very important to pay attention to let's begin um, uh, first since i've spoken about performance i will begin with the receiver and for me whether it's a child whether it's an adult how do i look at the receiver and here we learn lessons from the tantric school of thought so uh, for those who don't understand in india there are two words which are used often mantra tantra these words are used and people use them very casually but they have a very specific meaning mantra comes from mana mind you can't see the mind i can't see your mind you can't see my mind i can see your body body is tana tanu so tantra tantra is the body mantra is the mind which resides within the body so you have man inside and tan outside i access you through your body into your mind so i use i need have knowledge of mantra i need to have knowledge of tantra and the third thing that we talk of often is yantra yantra is tool or technology which only humans have animals don't have tools and technology i mean we can talk about birds having nests but those are arguments humans have tools and technology we that is what makes us special so mantra tantra yantra i use this framework all the time to explain concepts now let's look at the tantra the person the receiver the receiver has three parts when i look at the receiver i'm looking at you for example i first thing i notice is that you are a series of concentric circles now this word the technical word in tantra is koshas koshas are containers there is the flesh i can see the flesh beneath the flesh there is the breath prana right so this is your body but how do i engage with your body i engage with sensations i'll give you a simplified version sensations emotions and ideas three things sensations emotions ideas so when i say the sky is blue i am talking to your sensation when i say the sound of the river was like the tinkling of the bells i'm talking to your sensations of the year i said it was a very cold night and i was shivering i'm talking to your sensations which in sanskrit is called indriya purely sensations this is very important to evoke a mood it was very hot that day i was sweating the sweat tasted salty there was no tree anywhere so i'm now using sensations there is no emotion here then i bring emotion chitta chitta is emotion now i say i felt very sad i felt very happy i felt jealous i felt angry now emotions have emerged deeper than that is vichar or thought which is buddhi this is right this is wrong this was good this was bad judgment has come in judgment has come in so empathy comes in these are intellectual ideas slightly more tougher so everybody whenever an audience does gets bored i go to the basics go to the sensations sensations everybody responds smaller group responds to emotions still smaller groups responds to ideas so ideas is the toughest thing to achieve but if you don't go via the koshas people won't understand so if i see a bored audience i'm giving a lot of gyan a lot of theory i mean let me tell you a story and i see the audience perking up 
and I'm going to tell y'all also some stories to perk y'all up. But it has to go through this madhyam of sensations, that is Indriya. Then I will talk to emotions, which is Chitta. And then finally, I will talk to Buddhi, which is an ultimately Atma, which is later. Really, for a simplified way, Atma is empathy. When I tell the child that you are have to take care of other people, I have entered the Atma zone. As long as I tell the child, you have to take care of yourself, nobody loves you, you have to take care of yourself, it is Ahankar. The Atma, so the simple definition of Atma and Ahankar for me is when you think of others, it's Atma, when you think of yourself, it's Ahankar. Both are important in life. Anyway, that's enough about the receiver. So that's how you see the receiver. So I'm looking at the audience. Uh, sorry, I'm not completing the receiver. There are two, three other things about receiver. So receiver is koshas. This is the word kosha. And then comes chakras. This is very popular around the world. Chakras, chakras, chakras. And they're always... So while the koshas are concentric circles, the chakras are vertically aligned along the spine. Now, since you all deal with children, you are talking about spinal development. We all know the children will... First, they will be in bed. Then they'll start crawling. Then they start walking. I mean, toddling. That's how Krishna's story is told, right? This first child of Krishna is in a cradle. Then gradually, he becomes a toddler. Then he starts sitting up. Then he starts running away. So the mother has to tie him to a drum. So it becomes a toddler. So you have a God who is in the helpless newborn as in the cradle or in a basket that gradually becomes a child who can uh, crawl around the place. And that is when he's attacked by a lot of enemies. And then he becomes someone who toddles around. Then he becomes a little child who is trying to walk. Then he becomes stronger. He is able to steal butter. He becomes manipulative. He becomes, he plays games with his mother and the Gopikas. So suddenly with Krishna, you have got this evolution of the child and you are basically talking about how the chakras are opening up. So Maladwara chakra, the first thing we talk about is the child eating, is he doing potty? So Maladwara. Then gradually the other, the pleasure centers open up, then the money. So all these chakras, I mean the details and the names don't matter, but basically they're talking about evolution. How we start the heart chakra, then the throat chakra is able to talk, then the agna chakra he is now able to discriminate, and then the biggest chakra where he starts to empathize. Now this chakra is very difficult to grow up because we most of us are designed to think about ourselves. To think about others requires a lot of training. And that is why Atma Gyan is very difficult. Ahankar is default programming. All animals have it. We have to take care of ourselves. To take care of other people is Ahankar. Uh, sorry, Atma. And that is difficult. Atma, easy definition. Do you take care of other people? Simple. Difficult and Ahankar, I am only thinking about myself. I'm not thinking of other people. That's a very simple way to explain these concepts. People have made these concepts very popular, you know, mystical and magical. They're not mystical and magical at all. They're very basic. India was a land of farmers and cattle herders. And until about 200 years ago, we didn't have the industrial revolution. So we should use these Guruji's and all try to make it very complicated because they want a market share. But really, it's very, very simple. And these were ordinary people. You know, Jesus was a carpenter. Prophet Muhammad was a merchant. Their language was very simple. Nothing complicated in it. Krishna is a cowherd. Balaram is a farmer. So you have very simple stories. Buddha's father was a farmer. So we are talking about people who dealt with ordinary. That's why the, look at the vocabulary that they talk. Look at the vocabulary they use. Farming people. So they use the word bija phala. Bija seed. Phala fruit. Cattle herding people, they will always talk of yoni, yoni, yoni. Kaun se yoni se tumhara janam hua hai? That is womb. Are you born of an animal womb? Are you born from a goat's womb or a lion womb? So they're using words that they understand. Chakra becomes important. Why is chakra important? Wheels of a cart which take you from point A to point B. So, I mean, that's a big topic by itself. So as I said, when we talk of the receiver, we talk about... Koshas, we talk about chakra. And the third thing is nadi. Ida and pingala nadi. You can google this up, but a simple explanation is this. Left and right hemispheres. People have been arguing what does the left and right hemispheres do. There's a beautiful book called Master and His Emissary. The old theory that left brain is logical and right, wing is, uh, right brain is creative has been debunked and not accepted. However, the new theory is the left brain is 
focuses on attention, on, on focus, while the right brain has more perspective. Focus and perspective. Our brain's attention moves into these two things. And that's a beautiful concept. That's a beautiful concept. I use this, the words that I use is the left brain is sarpadrishti. Sarpadrishti looks like a snake and has a worm's eye view. Small things. Focus, 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 focus. And the right brain is garuda drishti. Garuda Drishti is a bird's eye view, perspective, big picture. And the two are always in conflict with each other. The snake and the eagle don't like each other. In the same way, the left and right brain are competing for attention. And the body, that is why yoga focuses on the left and right side, the nadis. So when you're telling children, at one time, the story has to have perspective, the big perspective. Once upon a time, there was a king who lived in a kingdom. Now that's a perspective. He had a brother who he did not like very much. Focus. So perspective and focus. Once upon a time, there was a great king who was plowing the earth and found a beautiful girl from the earth. Perspective. This girl was very strong and could pick up any weapon in her father's armory. Focus. So Sarpadrishti, Garuda Drishti. These three things are something that I remind myself when I'm talking to an audience. This is for me, the receiver. Now, having discussed the receiver, let's talk about content, which is storytelling, which is the, my forte. And storytelling, the, there are many words that are used. We tell stories, but stories, people ask me all the time, they say, what is myth, what is true, what is false? So let me explain it to you. And this definition is again very practical. Fact is everybody's truth based on measurement. Fact is everybody's truth based on measurement. That's the world of science. Fiction is the nobody's truth based on fantasy and imagination. Myth is somebody's truth. Somebody's truth. So your truth and my truth. I, have, I believe in some things, you believe in some things. That's the world of myth. So that's the easiest definition of the world. I respect your truth. You believe in God, I respect your truth. You respect my truth. And our truths expand over time. And because they expand over time, I need more information, which means I have to be curious about your truth. Because the more I talk to you, the more I learn from you, the more I learn from you, the more my truth expands. So we have to do samavad, not vivad. Vivad is argument. I am right, you are wrong. This does not expand our mind. We need to do samavad. Let me listen to your truth. You listen to my truth. And that's how conversations happen. So samavad, vivad. So myth is somebody's truth. Now, technically, uh, in the folklore realm, experts in folklore will tell you, myth deals with origins. How did the world begin? How does the world come to an end? Where The questions that nobody can answer. What is the purpose of life? What happens after death? So, for example, the Bible and the Quran say that when you die, you will be judged by God. And therefore, haram and halal, good things and bad things, uh, you have to follow the commandment. These are stories from the Bible and the Quran. They are not stories from India. From Buddhism, Jainism, don't talk about judgment today. This concept doesn't exist in Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism. These are talking about rebirth, punarjanm. It is talking about moksha, liberation. Rebirth. So it's a different set of stories. Now look at these two stories. These are myths of the world. They're shaping the way you see the world. This has to be separated from legends. Legends are stories which have a political basis. That is a simple way to remember. Legend means this politics. So Prithviraj Chauhan, Rajput ballads. These are all political. We know how political they are. That is a legend. Because it has a political implications. So that's a legend. What is a parable? Parable is a story where you have an agenda for a moral ending. Moral ending. This is right, this is wrong, this is good, this is bad. Do this, don't do this. So that becomes the world of parables. Fables, where animals talk, where animals can engage with you. So parables, fables, legends, myths. These are the different types of folklore which are part of storytelling. Right. So the moment you hear the word uh, legend, remember it's political. But the moment you hear the word myths, it's cosmic. It's big. It's very big. Myths are always very, very big ideas. 
Uh, let me give you an example of how myths can be used and a quick example I have. Uh, we have all been told Mahabharat is about uh, very biggest epic in the world and I have wanted to challenge myself. I said, how will I tell the story of the Mahabharat to say 10 year old kids, not preschool kids, but how do I tell stories to a 10 year old kid? And I said, okay, children deal with bullies. Every day they have to deal with bullies. How do you deal with bullies? One is to say the bully is a bad person an evil person. That's one model. The other model is, well, bullies are human beings too. I don't like them, I, but I don't have to hate them. I don't like what they do to me, but I don't want them to hurt me, but I don't think they're bad people. No, that's a different model. So my definition, I said, okay, let, how do I define dharma? I said, dharma is when you fight for what is right without hating the enemy. Don't hate them. You don't have to hate the bully. You have to not appreciate his behavior, but I don't have to hate him because he's a child too. Now that was very important for me and that's how I define dharma. Dharma is fighting for what is right, but not hating the people who do wrong. Now that created it. Then I said, okay, now how do I illustrate the hundred Kauravas? So I created, I understood they like emojis. So look at this. These are emojis of the hundred Kauravas. I created emojis of the hundred Kauravas. I, I hope you can see them. But that is how I created emojis. Now children understand emojis. Then I said, okay, how do I divide the story into... I said, okay, how do I give them, differentiate the Kauravas, 100 Kauravas. How do you remember their names? So I said, okay, let me give them tattoos. Or because there are so many characters, it becomes very difficult to understand. I don't think you can see it clearly. Uh, but let me see if I can get hold of a large image where the visuals are clear. So for example, in this picture, if you can look carefully, this is Duryodhan and you can see he has got a tattoo which says D1. So D1 is Duryodhan, D2 is Dushasan. And all the Pandavas have tattoos, S for Sahadev, Y for Yudhishthir, B for Bhima, A for Arjun. So tattoos children understand. So they're like, oh, I know the tattoo. So now the child parent can turn this into a way of explaining the characters. And you know, I am a great fan of Asterix comics and Asterix, I don't know if you all have read Asterix comics, Asterix is a lot of attention to detail about the Roman Empire, about uh, the Roman period, 2000, the, the authors of the book were paying a lot of attention to detail. And therefore, I said that even my book should have a lot of detail, which otherwise is forgotten. For example, if you look at the cover very carefully, all the Pandavas have certain flags. And each flag carries their symbol as it is written in the Vyasa's Mahabharata. So that is how you say that, oh, I looked at this is a swan. Who carries a swan? Sahadev carries a swan. Oh, this is an antelope. Who carries an antelope flag? That is Nakula. So you are now giving, even with illustration, you are trying to talk to children, explain to children. Finally, the story is very complicated. Everybody said it's a story. I said, okay, let me divide the story into a very simple format. I said the story is about six fights. Six, again, numbers people remember. Six fights. So if you think of the Rama, Mahabharata as a set of six battles. First battle, the Pandavas fight as orphans. Second, as refugees. Third, as kings. Fourth, as exiles. Fifth, as warriors, sixth as hermits. So now I have got six fights. So it becomes easy to remember. Now I've gone to buddhi level conversation. And I say the Mahabharat for children, the boys who fought. So you change the story in such a way. The boys who fought, Pandavas and Kauravas are boys and they're fighting. And we're talking about bullies. So I've made it about Something they will connect. Now compare this with Ramayana. Everybody told me Ramayana, the, the women are not treated properly in Ramayana. And I turned it into the girl who chose. Because if you read the Ramayana very carefully, without changing the story, Valmiki talks about Sita having five choices. And that is what I did. So that's about the content. I'm sorry I'm going a little fast. But... Um, you know, so that you have time for Q&A. So I've spoken to you about receiver. I have spoken to you about content. Now I come to the transmitter, the storyteller. You, the storyteller. What is the point to remember? And the big point is 
no matter how much agenda you have the children will figure out the way the world is on their own and you must not we must never try to plant ideas in children's minds they'll figure out the world we have to enable them to see the world so we have to focus not on ideas and this is what bharata shastra natya shastra is very clear focus on the indriyas focus on the chitta focus on the buddhi focus on the nadis the left and right brain focus on the koshas and the chakras but don't try to tell them how to see the world they will figure it out themselves that is their point and the transmitter has to learn one concept from vishnu the concept of avatar avatar is a very popular western idea now it is everywhere in the world people keep talking about avatar 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 doesn't mean wearing a mask avatar word and this is a very important idea that i would like you all to remember if you remember nothing from my talk please just remember this one concept called avatar avatar means avatarana to come down always talk to people in the level they understand you may know a lot of things you may have read a thousand books the person in front of you has not read a single book you so uh, an avatar is you know what is the difference between the infinite and the finite i'm giving a little technical thing so in something which is infinite becoming finite so in mythology vishnu is infinite and immortal but when he comes on earth he becomes finite and mortal which means he has birth and death and he has relatives is to deal with life this concept of coming down is called avatarana avatarana therefore from a practical point of view is you may be a super scholar but when you are dealing with students you have to bring knowledge down to their level and explain it to them the way they can understand which means empathy and that is what avatarana brings avatarana is about coming down to the level of your receiver and uplifting them uddhara uddhara is to uplift the person to your level so like we bend down to pick up children that is how a teacher has to deal with every person you talk to we are dealing with children we have to bend down if you don't to bend down is avatarana so vishnu becomes krishna to help arjun discover wisdom but knowing fully well he will fail and this is the big lesson which the mahabharat teaches us at the end of all the lectures you know after the end of the great lecture rama we are all told about bhagavad gita and we are told how krishna gives this great lecture to arjun god himself comes down to earth becomes a teacher and gives knowledge to arjun but at the end of the wars what they don't tell us is a little story from anushashan parva that at the end of the war the student goes to the teacher and tells arjun goes to krishna and tells krishna you know at the beginning of the war you gave a great speech with a lot of wisdom i don't remember anything can you please repeat and give me a summary of it and krishna is livid and angry and he says i gave such a great lecture called the bhagavad gita 700 verses i was inspired i was in a state of yoga i gave you the best lecture in the world and you didn't understand it and you are asking me to repeat it and he gives what is called the anu gita and the anu gita we all never nobody talks about the anu gita the iskon people don't talk about anu gita nobody talks about anu gita because it reveals that even god cannot teach the student no matter how hard you do how much hard you work you should not feel bad that the student with the receiver is not the transmitter the receiver is his own self it has his own indriyas it has his own it is a separate jeevatma and this idea this idea is very very important the idea that we cannot teach everything we try our best so the focus should be on the indriyas on the chitta on the buddhi on the atma on the ahankara it is not on the content not on trying to convert people making them think in a particular way not trying to make decent children uh, not trying to convert them to your way of thinking but enabling them to make the journey from ahankar to atma that means from thinking of themselves to thinking about others and this empathy empathy it means curiosity if you are curious you cannot empathize unless you are curious so you begin with curiosity you move towards empathy in order to make the child 
burst his seventh chakra, which is the great chakra that we want. All of us are struggling to open the seventh chakra. And that's my two few bits on storytelling and educating children and how to fire up the imagination of the so that the bij becomes a phala. Yeah. So that's the end of my talk. I don't know if we have time for question answers, but maybe we can take a few. Yeah, certainly. I hope people can hear me. Uh, I don't think you can see me right away. But I can but hear you. Yeah, so uh, I couldn't see any questions in the chat. That's because probably people were too mesmerized with all the concepts that you were telling. And you can see that, you know, a whole lot of appreciation for you on the screen. Thank you. Uh, in a digital way. Thank you so yeah. much. So, uh, really looking forward to people putting questions on the chat while I have a few, uh, sorry, in the Q&A, while I have a few of my own, but I do think that uh, Professor Vasudevi Reddy, who's uh, joined us uh, and is one of the plenary speakers, to one of your comments, I think, to, uh, you know, what you were talking about, Avtar and Uttar, I think she had a comment which said, uh, but isn't it always between? The student and the teacher, and she puts between inverted commas. You can see that comment in the chat, not just in the one or the other. So, uh, if you know, if you can see sort of respond to this comment of hers, if you can see it. But isn't it always between the student and the teacher, not just in the one or the other? Uh, so to ask with me, you see, a, as a, as that. the transmitter, the obligation falls on you. It is. The res because you are the one giving the story. Nobody, the receiver is not obliged to receive anything. He just can switch off completely. You are the transmitter and therefore, while we keep saying the student, most children are brought to school because they're being forced to brought to school. Nobody, the child doesn't want to be there. Unfortunately, the system that we have today, you have, to, you're forced to go there. But the thing is, it's not like a contract between the student and the teacher. This is very clearly a one-way traffic. And therefore, the, the pressure of performance is on the transmitter uh, than on the receiver. So that it's a very complex thing because uh, we can argue that the teacher is also there by, because of a contract with the organization. And that's the modern method of education where uh, while in the old Patshala method, you came because you were interested. So one of the things that um, um, you must have, uh, you know, in, in, in the traditional model, there is no obligation. You are not obliged to go to the teacher's house. The teacher has to work hard like a magnet to work to bring you toward. That is why, um, uh, you know, the uh, uh, Natya Shastra is about performance. The better your performance, the more teacher, student. So they're actually comparing even pedagogy with performance. There was another comment uh, by Dr. Rajashmi Shriram in the chat and she mentioned that the various methods and techniques which you said, appearance and disappearance is also a part of the storytelling technique. I think that was a little uh, a quip at the fact that we were appearing and disappearing with the live stream. <laughs> Even, I don't know, it could be a metaphor or it could be a real comment. types of types of stories so and so to say which you spoke about you know legends fables and all of that is there any type which should not be narrated to children I no no one. everything should be narrated to children everything um, you know, uh, you can't, uh, I personally believe, I don't believe in censorship genuinely. I believe the child, you should enable the child so that the child, just as we teach children what is good touch, what is bad touch, how to be aware of dangers, because they are going to live in a bit bad world. There are going to be horrible things in this world. We have to prepare children to be anti-fragile. You know, I use this uh, in my book, Hope. I talk about princess you know there is you know in olden days uh, there used to be this princess and the pea story princess and the yeah. pea there's this princess who would sleep on 20 mattresses so in hindi i call it rajkumari matri who is so sensitive that even ek matter se usko takleef hota hai and then i use the opposite called princess jwala it is like you know the goddess who can walk through fire so i said what kind of children do we want do we want rajkumari matri or do we want rajkumari jwala so, you know, I would work towards Rajkumari Jwala. We are all a little bit of Matri. Sometimes we get hurt, but we are also Jwala. 
and I think that we have to work with the two princesses in us in our bodies. Yeah, never thought about it like that. <laughs> Dr. Chaudhary has a question in the Q and A. She says that what I see around me, and she's presently in Chicago, uh, is, is is the excessive use of talk by adults to children. Can you reflect on the role of silence and reflection? You see, the Western culture, unfortunately, is about indoctrination. It has become a culture of indoctrination. So I will tell the child to be good because if I don't tell the child, how will the child know to be good? So it's it, that is the approach. That if I, it's like a software download. If I don't download the software, the child, the machine will get spoiled. And that's the model, unfortunately, um, which is being. Um, I'm. Can you see me? Because I can't see myself. Just checking. Can't see you right now. One minute. Now I think it's back. Not yet. Now? Yeah. Oh, yes. Okay. So, uh, basically, what happens is uh, this Western model is about indoctrination, download of software. I have to give the right software, and therefore, these kind of crazy fights which are happening in America, which is really scary. There is this book called Anti-Racist Baby, which actually says children are not born; they are bred. these kind of theories written which keep coming in the world there is always this nurture nature theory whether nature works or nurture things but it is as somebody said uh, you know le- length and breadth to measure the area of a field so you can't say one is better than the other it can't be one or the other your brain this whole monotheistic thinking which leads to monotruism only one truth exists is a very western phenomena india is about anekantvad multiple truths so you can't have this one you have to give multiple ideas that's why stories and all mythologies have paradoxes why do they have paradoxes because life is paradoxical mother can be good mother can be bad father can be good father can be bad and therefore you have asuras who are good and devas who are evil so this complication is what children you don't give indoctrinate children and that's what i feel west is unfortunately going through through it's a very sad fat phase in the western world where it is you know what this was the problem with the enlightenment they discarded traditional knowledge completely which is never the case you should always work on what is already there rather than trying to create something new and that is the model which india would always say ki khat agar dal khatta ho gaya hai if the, the you are cooking food and the food has become sour you don't throw the dal away right you add new spices you add new vegetables and you try to create a new dish you put curds in it you you figure out a way of salvaging the food you don't start afresh you can't and that is a good model the kitchen is a great place to learn that while cooking we all know things can go wrong right suddenly you put a little extra sweet you put a little extra sugar extra salt extra pepper you can't throw the dish away you're too poor you can't afford it all you have to do is put some potato put some water simmer a little bit longer and try to salvage the dish west doesn't understand that they are trying to create this indoctrination cults and we should be very careful of this kind of models because they are they don't last the test of time We have many questions, Devdar. But in the interest of time, I'll take up only one more, which if you could answer briefly. Sure. So, Ati is asking that myths are important for culture to flourish, but how do we start? You know, ensure that people do not start believing it as a reality. It is somebody's reality. That is the definition of myth. Myth. See, the assumption in this question is myth is false, and that reeks of lack of empathy. If somebody says I believe in Allah will you tell that person that Allah is false you will not do that right Allah is real paigambar muhammad is real isha masiha is real for the person who believes it is real if i want to do hajj who are you to tell me that that is not real so we have to be very careful if i be, justice is not real there is no proof of justice there is no proof of equality yet we believe in justice and equality aren't they false ideas that we plant in children to break their heart disney keeps telling children that there is true love true love true love all of us with broken heart know that true love is is it true or is it a myth that you believe in because you want to survive so justice equality is just like god a belief that helps us navigate through life if somebody tells me that justice is real they are lying to the children 
Go and tell all those prisoners who are in jail awaiting trial for 10 years that justice is real. That is a cruel statement to make to children. That justice is real, equality is real, love is real. Go and tell the girl whose heart has been broken, who has been kicked out of her uh, husband's house, that love is real. So children will go through that in their life. So don't lie to children by saying that there is justice in the world. There is equality in the world. Just as you will not tell them that God doesn't exist, Ram doesn't exist, Krishna doesn't exist, justice doesn't exist. So be careful of these ideological approaches to storytelling. Thank you so much, Devdra. There are a few more questions, but we have promised the participants that we will post those questions to the speaker, get the speaker's response and mail it to them. Perfect. You can send it to me. I'll video film it and send it across to you. Yeah, that's great. I mean, your talk was mesmerizing. We don't really want you to leave, but I think we have no choice but to carry on the session forward. And we do look forward to you being on the platform of our association in many different ways. Thank and maybe you. not simply as a guest speaker, Thank maybe you. some workshops or some Done. more ideas about helping us to reach out to children and do our task. I'll do that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And if you permit me to remove you from stage and put the next Please speaker. do so. Please do so. Yeah?